All right, so we're going to pick up in Leviticus 11. We have a few people here uh, today who were not not been with us through the whole series here. So we're going through Leviticus expository preaching, and uh, we're doing it just because it's there. So that's uh, you know, <laughs> there's a lot a lot of great stuff in the book of Leviticus, and uh, so I don't know if you knew that when you when you decided to join us this morning. We're, we're, we're in Leviticus. It's gonna be it's gonna be great. So um, first seven chapters go through rules for the different sacrifices. We talked about that already. And then there's the process of ordaining the priests, and we talked about how the, the four elements of the priesthood, it's, it talks about how they were washed, they were clothed, they were anointed, and then they offered all different sacrifices. And that's exactly the pre, when Peter says that we're, we are now a member of a royal priesthood. So we look back to the priests, we should see our own lives played out in there. And Paul says in Romans chapter 12, great transition verse, that we are now to offer our bodies as living sacrifices before the Lord. So there's a lot, a lot for the Christians to learn from in, in these stories. And then the last thing we looked at was in Leviticus 10, the tragic story of Nadab and Abihu, the two oldest sons. So now after we, after we learn that the priests foreshadow us, we see that half of them get struck dead <laughs> for disobeying the Lord. So very sobering message from that. They're off a strange fire before the Lord. We talked uh, about that the last time together from Leviticus chapter 10. So Leviticus 11 is the chapter that talks about the clean and unclean animals. And so some of you are going to be thinking, well, what on earth does that have since the Levitical law has been done away with? What does that have to do with me? And I would say, if you're thinking that, just, just hold that thought and go back and revisit it at the end of the lesson today to, to do that. So I want to, I want to take a look at what it says and then what's the significance for us in this story. Now, now, even before we do that, the whole question about clean and unclean animals. Now, before Leviticus chapter 11, is there any place in scripture that talks about clean and unclean animals? And I see, I see at least one nodding head and a few puzzled looks here. Actually, it talks about that in the story of the flood. Remember when the animals are going on to the ark and the cattle are going on to the ark and Everyone thinks from the children's song, they're going on two by two. It says, well, they're going on spice. That's right. So somebody here notices and it says they're, the clean cattle are going on by sevens and the unclean cattle are going on by twos, the animals. So, so some so the cleaner, the seven, but how did Noah know what was a clean animal and what wasn't? A Le Le Leviticus 11 didn't exist yet. And the other thing that struck me is it's my impression is at this point in time that everybody's vegetarians. Now we have at least one vegetarian who's, who's in, the, in the class, they would, but they're all in the beginning in Genesis, when the Lord made man, he talked about uh, Genesis 1:29 that God gave him all the plants of the field, all the herbs to, to eat. Uh, didn't say anything about giving him animals to eat. So my impression was that Men didn't start to eat meat until after the flood, where the Lord then says, now I open things up. And uh, Genesis chapter 9, he talks about, now I'm going to give you the food to eat also. So after Noah and the animals get off the ark, he sacrifices some of the clean animals, which is why he had to bring seven of them along, because if he only brought two, he sacrifice one of them, you're done. That animal will be gone. So the clean and unclean animals in the story of Genesis, it seems to me, is referring to they were clean to be offered as a sacrifice to the Lord more than more than uh, clean for eating. So that, 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 that's my impression there because no one before the flood, no one was eating animals, I don't think. So Leviticus 11 is a shift in this discussion about clean and unclean animals. Now in Leviticus 10, where we left off, I wanna, I wanna look at one verse here in Leviticus 10. Now this is, after Nadab and Abihu are struck dead, and 
we have God gives further instructions and he says, you're not going to be drinking wine or other strong alcoholic drink before you go up to serve the Lord at the temple or before you in, in the tabernacle or before you serve before the altar. And he gives the reason for that. He says, lest so that you can distinguish between the holy and unholy, between the clean and the unclean, and teach the children of Israel all the ordinances the Lord spoke to Moses. So that's what he says. He, you need to be sober so that you can distinguish between the clean and the unclean, the holy and the unholy. Well, what's the distinguishing between the holy and the unholy? Well, he, and the clean and the unclean. He talks about that here in chapter 11. He's talking about the clean and the unclean pertaining to animals. And this is about animals you can eat and also about animals you can touch after they die. That's what this is talking about. So I want to take this one sec segment at a time. I want to go through this, and I've warned Adam that there's going to be a quiz afterwards, and some of the questions may possibly be directed at him. So some of you know, I stay up late at night trying to, Adam, Adam contributes a lot to this class, and a lot of times I'll stay up late at night trying to think, how can I stump Adam? Can I come up with a tough question? So, so he's looking a little bit worried right now, but you got to listen, listen up to this, Adam. So we're going to take the, the groups of animals one at a time. We're going to start with, he starts with the land animals, and then he talks about the, the sea animals. He talks about the animals that fly, and then he talks about the insects and the reptiles and the creeping things. So let's take the first segment, Leviticus chapter 11, verses 1 to 8. This is the best known segment in Leviticus 11. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals you may eat among the animals on the earth. Whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it's unclean to you. The rock hyrax, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. So let's process this, make sure we understand what he's saying here. So this is talking about land animals, maybe it's talking about mammals here. And there are two criteria, it has to meet both criteria. One out of two is no good. So you have to be, you have to go two for two on this and the, the, it has to chew the cud and it has to have split hoofs. So chewing the cud. Now I did not grow up in the country, some people here did. And for people who grow up in the country, you know this very well, but you'll look at a cow or a sheep or a goat and you'll see that it's chewing, but it didn't eat anything in the last half hour. So what, what it did was it ate something a long time ago and a cow will have, I think the cows have seven different, seven stomachs in there instead of one like we do. And it's because they live on grass. Now it's very hard to survive on just grass. So you have, to, you have to get all of the nutrient out of the grass. So they, they've got to chew it, they've got to break it down, they have multiple stomachs to break it down with different bacteria living in each one. So there's a whole complicated biological and microbiological process to breaking down grass into something that can turn into all the things that a cow needs in life. So that's chewing the cud. So animals that chew the cud will eat grass. They're designed for this. They're, God designed them and made them specifically to do this. They can survive on it. So they'll chew it and they'll, they'll swallow it down while it's there. And then when they have some spare time, they'll cough it up. This is disgusting, but this is what they do. They cough it up, they regurgitate it, and they, they're called ruminants because they ruminate on 
what they ate previously. They'll chew it again and again and again. They'll swallow it back down. They'll bring it up. They'll chew it again. But so that's what they do. That's chewing the cud. All right. So he says chewing the cud is, is the first part. And the second part is they have to have split hoofs, which means an animal that has no hoofs at all, like a rabbit or a bear, uh, you can't eat. So it's got to have, but, but, but an animal that just has one monolithic single hoof, like a camel or a horse, even though it chews the cud is no good. You have to have split hoof. So a split hoof is, if you look at the foot of a pig or a sheep or a goat, it's got two sections. There's one on the left and one on the right, and they have a little bit of play between the two of them. So rather than one monolithic hoof like a horse, it's got two hooves and there's a little bit of play. And the advantage of having a split hoof is that it, it's much more sure-footed on uneven terrain. So for example, a mountain goat is you know, climbing up the side of a mountain. How does it do that? Well, part of what it does is it has some play with the two hoofs. It's much more sure-footed than a camel or a horse would be. So, so these animals can survive in tougher terrain. So this is the, uh, now most animals of course have no hooves at all, dogs, uh, foxes, bears, people, cats, they have either, they have feet like we do or they have claws or paws or something like that. But you have to have split hooves and chew the cut. One out of two is not good enough. And he makes a point, it says horses and camels and rabbits while they chew the cud, they don't have a split hoof. So they are off the table for eating. On the other hand, pigs do have split hoofs, but they don't chew the cud. Pigs are not designed for eating grass. Pigs eat garbage, okay? <laughs> Basically, anything, you know, that's what farmers like to have pigs because the pigs will eat the garbage. The things that are left over, the scraps, you throw them to the pigs and the pigs are indiscriminate and will eat all kinds of stuff. They don't just eat grass, they eat all kinds of things. So, um, so they're considered unclean. So the clean animals would include the goats, the deer, the cows, you know, things like that, uh, the sheep. The unclean animals you can't eat, nor can you touch their dead carcasses. So if one of an unclean animal dies and you touch the carcass, you're unclean for a period of time. So those are the land animals. I'm gonna go through all the different segments of, of, of the different types of animals. And then I'm gonna have a little quiz uh, for, for Adam on can you eat this or not, all right? <laughs> Leviticus, so the next segment is on the water animals. Leviticus 11, verses 9 to 12. These you may eat of everything in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. But everything in the water or in the seas or rivers that does not have fins or scales, from all these and from every living creature in the water, which the waters produce, are an abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you and you shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. A lot of us in New England, New England is famous for its seafood and a lot of the favorite, favorite things that New Englanders like to eat are off the list here. So this is, uh, so let's think about this, just like there are two criteria <laughs> If it, if it comes out of the water, doesn't matter if it's some salt water or fresh water, it must have fins and scales. So let's think of a few things. Here in New England, the most famous food coming out of New England is lobsters and clams with seafood. They're off the table. They don't have fins or scales. Uh, you know, uh, lobsters, crabs, clams, and oysters, eels. Now, we may not think of eels as particularly appetizing things, particularly if you've ever actually seen an eel. They're pretty creepy looking creatures in, in my estimation, but there are a lot of people who like eel, who like to eat eel. And, and the uh, Asians eat a lot of things that we don't. And one of them, you can get sushi, which has, which has eel in it, which is raw, uncooked eel. So that's, uh, but eels are out 
catfish. When I was a young boy, I started fishing for catfish. Catfish don't have scales. They have long whiskers, but they don't have any skin. They have fins, but they don't have scales and they live down in the mud. They're kind of, they're not your super healthy fish. Put it this way, they live down in the mud in the bottom, they're bottom dwellers. And uh, so you can't eat catfish. Uh, sharks, stingrays, also calamari. There you go. Sorry, I'm sorry to break your heart. I guess color. I said people love calamari, uh, which is squid, octopus. You can't eat. Can't eat those things. Sea turtles, dolphins, whales, porpoises. Anything from the sea that doesn't have fins and scales can't eat it. All right. So the things you can eat are the normal fish that live in nice running water that have fins and scales. The, the normal fish that you think of the. Uh, the, the, the bass and the trout and, and, and the, the bluefish and things like that. All right, third category is the, it says birds in here, but the actual, Septuagint, the actual word means winged creatures because I get, I get it, I get to people sometimes uh, from a Muslim background, they're trying to pick holes in the Bible and it says you can't eat from any of these birds and it throws bats in at the end. You say, well, there's an error in the Bible because a bat isn't a bird. Now, of course, the, our, our modern system of breaking down the various animals in the world in these different categories didn't exist yet, first of all. Second of all, the term that's used here means winged creatures, anything that flies. Basically, that's what it is. So, and it, and it occurs several places in the Old Testament. But that, so that's the word, is winged creatures. So the winged creatures, the clean versus the unclean. Verse 13, now these you shall regard as abomination among the birds, or as I said, winged creatures. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the ossifrage, the sea eagle, the kite, the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl, the screech owl, the white owl, jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron after its kind, the hoopoe, and the bat. So now it doesn't give you criteria. It just lists a bunch of, of animals. And the Jews who are trying to follow the kosher laws here, the dietary restrictions, they have a little trouble because some of these things, they're written in Hebrew, and they're trying to figure out what animal exactly does this refer to? And it doesn't tell you the criteria, it just mentions a number of animals by name. There are 20 something animals that are mentioned by name here. So they have to figure out what those animals are. And the idea is anything that's not on the list, you can eat. So that would be chickens, ducks, turkeys, you know, the things that the, the, the birds that we normally eat, pigeons, some people like to eat squab, little baby pigeons, those are okay to eat. So, so that's the, the way that you, uh, uh, the way that you address that. This is, a, this is just a list of things that are prohibited that you cannot eat. So the things I notice about these uh, that they have in common is they are generally predatory birds, first of all. They are you know, the, the a carrion eating birds, birds that eat roadkill, basically, <laughs> eat dead things. You don't eat them. But the domestic, the domestic poultry like ducks and chicken, geese and things like that, turkeys, those, those you can't eat. Okay. Now let's move on here into verse 20, next category. It says, now all the flying insects that creep on all fours shall be an abomination to you. And actually, the word insects there, I think that the translators, I'm reading from the Orthodox Study Bible, which is based on the Septuagint, although they tend to defer to whatever is in the King James or the New King, King James, when in doubt. The, the word that's used there is literally it's creeping things, okay? It's the creeping things. And it, it shows up in the beginning of Genesis. So... Uh, they're reading into it, creeping things that fly. I guess they're figuring that must be the insects. So it's talking about the creeping things. Uh, and in the scriptures where this word is used, sometimes reptiles are included with that. They're considered creeping things. The only creeping things 
that you can eat. It says here, these you may eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours, those which have jointed legs above their feet with which to leap on the earth. These you may eat the locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, the grasshopper after its kind. All other insects which have four feet shall be an abomination to you. So uh, you can eat insects that have uh, jointed legs so that they can jump. You can eat the jumping flying insects, all right? So that's locusts. When it talks about how John the Baptist was eating locusts and wild honey, there you go. So he's, it's okay to eat locusts. So eating locusts are all right. Crickets, which sounds really disgusting. And grasshoppers, which I guess is like locusts, but he says you can, you know, things get really bad. You can eat those things. Those things are considered to be clean. All the other creeping, flying things are off the table. Uh, and then he goes here, there are some other creeping things that are addressed in uh, verses 29 to 31. These also you should be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the earth, the mole, the mouse, the large lizard after its kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all the things that creep. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until evening. And then down to verse 41. Now, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth shall be an abomination, shall not be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, whatever has many feet among all creeping things that creep on the earth, these you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. You shall not make for yourselves you shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. Neither shall you defile your souls with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I shall therefore be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. This is the law of the animals and the birds, and every living creature that moves in the waters, and of every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between the unclean and the clean, between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may <coughs> not be eaten. So there's a lot in here. A couple of things I notice here is, well, why can't you eat these other animals? Why can't you have, you know, why, why, why only these animals? Why can't you eat the other animals? And he says, eating unclean things will defile you. And then he also says, and this is very important, verse that Peter picks up on. He says, I am a holy God, and you must be holy because I am holy. That's Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. Peter talks about that in 1 Peter. He says, you need to be living holy lives as lives that are set apart for God, because just like it says in the Old Testament, you must be holy because I am holy. So that being a, being being a, a Christian following God, according to Peter, you can't reduce it to a list of 50 rules or 100 rules. He said, it's not like that. God is a holy God. He is set apart. So we must be living lives that are set apart. And he, he uses this verse in Leviticus. This is the first place it shows up, but there are several other places. Be holy because I am holy. God is a holy God. If we're serving him, we must be holy people, must be set apart. And this is reflected by the way that they eat. They're going to eat in a way that's set apart from the nations. And also at verses 46 and 47, it says the law is to help them distinguish between the unclean and the clean. All right. So that's a, I want you to just let that verse sit with you for a second. The law is given to help you distinguish between the clean and the unclean, because we're going to come back to that. That's a, there's, there's a few things that are hidden in this story. One of them is be holy because I'm holy. 
And the other one is that uh, God wants you to be able to distinguish between the clean and the unclean. That's why this is in here. And I think this will, this will tie back to some things we'll look at later. Now, uh, Deuteronomy 14, there's a little restatement of these dietary laws and it mentions more specifically, it gets into specifics about some of the animals. And it says there, you can't eat something that dies by itself. But it says, so, so if you have an animal and you don't kill it, but it dies by itself, it says you can't eat it. However, you can sell it to a foreigner. So if you can do that, they don't have to be, you have to be holy, they don't. So you can sell, sell it off to a foreigner, but you can't, can't eat it yourself, which I found kind of amusing. And then there's another statement in that in, in Deuteronomy 14, 1 to 22, where it says you don't boil a lamb in its mother's milk. And so those of you who have been around people who are Jewish, who are conservative or orthodox, who try to follow the dietary laws, they'll have one set of utensils for meat and they'll have another one for dairy because of, because of that restriction. So they try to keep the two separate. This is basically the, the kosher dietary rules that are still, the Jews still struggle with, with following these things. So, so the question is, why did God come up with these specific rules? And I remember years ago, a friend of mine, he was a physician, he was a medical missionary, and he came up here to go to Harvard School of Public Health to get a master's in public health. So Dr. Richard Reinbold is working with Guatemala and other places in the Spanish-speaking world. And I remember discussing this with him, and he said that actually there's good public health reasons for some of these requirements. For example, the, the, in the case of uh, pigs, pigs are, uh, and I'm sorry for people from German or Polish descent or any Asians who may be offended by this, but uh, you love eating pork, but uh, pigs, are more susceptible to certain diseases like trichinosis than other animals are. Okay, then keep in mind the pigs also eat garbage, they eat anything, so as opposed to animals that are just eating pure grass. So, so he says pigs, if you wanna stay healthy, that's a good thing to stay away from, particularly in developing countries. And the other thing is shellfish. Now remember, I'm, my background is environmental engineering, so I focus on water pollution. And so I learned a lot of things about water pollution. And one of the things is, you need the, if you wanna go swimming, the water's gotta be pretty clean, all right? You know, so you don't get sick. But the cleanest water of all is the water that you're harvesting shellfish from. That has to be absolutely the cleanest water of all because what shellfish do, they are, they are what they call filter feeders. So basically the way that they eat, they don't go around and, and bite things because they don't have any mouth. So what they do is, they filter an enormous, like they're like giant pumps. They pump an enormous amount of seawater through themselves, and then they filter out any particles that are in there. So that's where they get their nourishment from. So they're not terribly discriminating. So what they tend to do is they tend to concentrate whatever happens to be in the water. So the, the net effect of shellfish is the water around the shellfish becomes much cleaner as the shellfish concentrate all the pollutants in themselves. So even if there's a little tiny bit of bacterial pollution in the water, it gets concentrated in the shellfish. And so if you eat raw shellfish, that it's not from extremely pure water, you're gonna get horribly sick. Okay, so, the, so this is the nature of their filter feeders. So any pollution, and back in those days, you know, all the wastewater, I'm sure went, went right out of the ocean. So it says, don't stay away from shellfish. Just, it's gotta have fins and scales. And you're also, you're not eating the animals like the catfish that are dwelling on the bottom, who knows what's down there. So, so my friend Richard Reimel was saying, there's good public health reasons that are behind this. And maybe there was, I mean, God had his reasons for doing this. That may be part of it. And so we'll just, we'll just park that and think about that. So, but before I move on here, one, I told you I was gonna quiz, quiz Adam here. So I wanna make sure everybody, you, you can, Take the quiz yourself. So I'm going to ask you. This is this is the, the name of this is called Moses. May I eat it? All right. That's that's <laughs> Moses. May I eat it? All right. I just made this. I invented this. And for those who don't come with us, we don't normally have games in in our lessons. In fact, we never have. But this is I just just came up with this one here. So so Adam, 
Somebody offers you to, to go out to a barbecue, all right? This is a smoky barbecue, and they have really good pulled pork sandwiches. Moses, may I eat it? Yes or no? Um, pulled pork. So pork is pig, so. Yep. No. All right, good, right answer, okay. Bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. Your mother makes a nice bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. Moses, may I eat the BLT? Bacon is also pig, so no. No, okay, very good, excellent. That's good. All right, uh, you're in a very dry country, Ethiopia, and the locusts have come through and they've eaten everything. There's nothing left to eat except a bunch of locusts that are hopping around. And somebody says, hey, if we're going to starve to death, we don't eat these locusts. Is it okay to roast the locusts and eat them? Moses, may I? That's a yes. Okay, that's a yes. That's good. So you're doing good here. And then, and then one last one. This is uh, the, your, your, your friend says, I want to take you to Woodman's in, in Ipswich here in Massachusetts. This is where they invented the fried clam. And they fry the clams, but this this stuff, th these are not just your typical fried clams. They do it the old fashioned way. They fry them in lard, okay? So would you like to come with me and try the Woodman's fried clam? Can you, Moses, may I? Clams, I think it's a no, because yeah. they're shell creatures. Absolutely, so you, you get you get 100% on that one out, very good, so that's right. They're shellfish and they're fried in lard on top of it too, so that's a double no on that one. So no clams, no lobsters, uh, and none of that stuff. So very good, Adam, I appreciate that. Um, if we had more time, I'd give you a lightning round, but I'll just I'll just say you, 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 you won on that one. Now, so we're kidding around about this, but I just wanted to get a get a feel for. There's a lot of things that, that you that you would, we would like to eat, that we enjoy eating that we couldn't eat. So it's a, it's a bit of a bit of an inconvenience to have to follow these rules. Whenever God gives a command, it tests people's hearts and it exposes their hearts. It exposes what's in their hearts. And this command is no different. It showed the worst and the best of the Jews who came after this. And I want to show you examples of both. Turn to Isaiah 65. Isaiah is addressing the sins of the nation. And in Isaiah 65, in the beginning, this may sound familiar because it's in Romans chapter 10, which we, uh, I'll start reading in verse 1. Isaiah 65 and verse 1. I was manifest to those who did not seek me. I was found by those who did not ask for me. I said, behold, I am here to a nation that did not call on my name. I stretched out my hands the whole day long to a people who disobeyed and contradicted me, who did not walk in the true way, but after their sins. This is the people who provoked me continually to my face. They sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on bricks to the demons which do not exist. And they sleep in graves and caves for the sake of dreams. They who eat swine's flesh and the sauce of their sacrifices, which defiles all their vessels, who say, stay away from me. Don't come near me, for I am clean. This is the smoke of my anger. A fire burns in it all day long. Behold, it is written before me, I will not be silent, says the Lord, until... I repay into their bosom their sins and the sins of their fathers. So it's talking about all the sins and the corruption, the decadence that the people have fallen into. They're going after demons. They're getting involved in the cult. And he says, and they're eating the flesh of swines. And God says, I'm going to repay them. They've turned completely against me. And chapter 66 there's a similar statement about the people in his day who turned away and were eating flesh, and they considered the laws of God to be an inconvenience. So people said, don't touch me, I'm clean, but they're eating pig's flesh. So they're, they're corrupt, they're depraved. So this was the, the, the commands of God. You see what happens to people who drifted away from the commands of God and blatantly disobeyed them among the Jews. 
a little while after this, <clears throat> in a book called Second Maccabees. So this is when I when I was growing up Catholic. Second Maccabees was in my Bible. It's in the Orthodox Bibles as well. It's not in Protestant Bibles, but if you have an Old King James, it'll be in there from let's say 1900 or before. So whether you consider this to be scripture or not, it's a, a fascinating story. In Second Maccabees. So you can just listen along with me. So Second Maccabees is taking place during the time, a few hundred years before Christ, during the time where the, you know, talks about how the, the Babylonian Empire gave way to the Persian Empire, which then gave way to the Greek Empire under Alexander, and then that broke up into four pieces. The, the, the Greek Empire broke into four pieces after that, before the time of the Roman Empire came. So this is during the, during the time of the Greeks, and so the, there's one of the one of the remnants of the Greek Empire is ruling over Israel, and they're trying to enforce pagan customs on the Jews, and it's not going very well. In Second Maccabees chapter six, very disturbing story, but it ties in with with the, the dietary laws, starting in verse eighteen. It says, Eliezer, one of the scribes in a high position, a man already advanced in years and of a noble presence, was forced to open his mouth to eat swine's flesh. But welcoming an honorable death rather than a defiled life, he spat out the flesh and approached the rack of his own accord. He did as men should do who refuse what is not lawful to eat, even for the love of life. Those in charge of the unlawful sacrifice, because of their longtime acquaintance with him, took the man aside privately and urged him to bring meat proper for him to use, pretending to prepare for himself as though we're eating the flesh of the sacrifice commanded by the king. Thus, by doing this, he might be saved from death and be treated kindly on account of his long friendship with them. So you get the idea. So they're sacrificing a pig, and they're saying, I need to eat the flesh of the pig that was sacrificed. He says, you kill me. I said, I'd rather have, I'd rather have a pure life, a pure death and a defiled life. So just go ahead and kill me. And they say, they don't want to do this. And so they say, look, we'll, we'll give you some lamb and or some goat or some clean animal, and we'll just pretend that we're eating the pig sacrifice. So you won't actually have to violate your conscience or you won't have to break the law of Moses. But everybody will think you're doing this. We don't want to kill you. And so they're offering, they're throwing him a lifeline. They're saying, here's a way out. And his response is very interesting. Verse 22, but making an honorable resolve worthy of his years and the dignity of his old age and gray hair, which he had reached through the distinction of his excellent life, even from childhood. And moreover, according to the holy God-given laws, he turned himself over to them quickly, telling them to send him immediately to Hades. For to pretend such things, he said, is not worthy of our time of life, lest many of the young should suppose that Eliezer in his 90th year has gone over to a foreign religion. And because of my pretense for the sake of living a brief moment longer, they should be led astray through me while I earn only pollution and defilement in my old age. For even if for the present I should avoid the punishment of men, yet whether I live or die, I shall not escape the hands of the Almighty. Therefore, by manfully giving up my life now, I will show myself worthy of my old age and leave to the young a noble example of how to do a good death willingly and bravely for the venerable and holy laws. After he said this, he went straight to the rack, and those who had just demonstrated goodwill toward him now showed hostility because they took the words he had spoken to be madness. When he was about to die from the blows, he groaned and said, it's evident to the Lord in his holy knowledge that though I could have been saved from death, I'm enduring terrible sufferings in my body from this beating. 
but in my soul, I gladly suffer these things because I fear him. So in this manner, he died, leaving in his death an example of his noble character and a memorial of his virtue, not only to the young, but to the many people of his nation. Like, boy, what a, what a heroic example of faith. This is all you have to, he didn't, eat, he didn't even have to eat any pork. All he had to do is pretend he was eating pork and he wouldn't do it. He says, so, you know, he says, what am I gonna gain? Just a little more time here? He's a 90 year old man. He says, I'm gonna gain a little, a little bit more time. What am I gonna lose? I'm gonna lose eternity. Send me to Hades now. I'm going there anyway. But this to me, this is an example of a heroic old man. He's in his 90s. I, I, and I'm, I'm in my 60s right now. And I need people who are ahead of me, who are running the race, who are showing me how to finish the race. This is so, like somebody's running the marathon and they see the end in sight. And so what do they do? They, 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 they pour it on at the end because they want to finish strong. So this is a wonderful example over something you think, well, what's the big deal about eating something? He said, look, this is the laws of God. That's a non-negotiable. That's not, that's not up for discussion. This is a command of God. That's a non-starter. And, and, and I want to leave a legacy for those who come after me to be a heroic example. And that's what the elders, that's what those of us who are older should be looking to do in life, the sending a, bl a blazing example for those who follow. I shared this story with Allison uh, this, this past week. <clears throat> and uh, her reaction was, <clears throat> her reaction was, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> down the wrong way. <clears throat> Sorry. So her reaction was one that, Maybe you can relate to. She says, "Boy, I don't know if I was if I was put in that situation. I don't know if I would have what it takes to respond in the way that guy did. You know, if, if someone was threatening me with torture and death to to give up on one of the commands of God, would I would I have the strength to do that?" She said, "I don't know if I would or not." And uh, very, very, I appreciate it. very honest response to wrestle with that and imagine yourself in that situation. I reminded her there's a promise of God in 1 Corinthians 10. It says, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. It's a promise of God. And it says, God is faithful. God always tells the truth. He never lies. If God puts you through a trial like this, at some point in your life, then he knows that you can take it somehow, some way. He's not going to put you in a situation you can't handle. This man was put in a terrible situation, but he had the strength to handle it. And he came through in a, in a blaze of glory. And, and after this, chapter 7, we're not going to read that, but there's a, an, an equally convicting story about seven brothers who one at a time are faced with the same choice, basically, and then their mother, after seeing her seven sons die, and the response that they had, and they're looking for the resurrection of the dead. And, uh, you know, that one of the, one of the boys, he says, we're going to chop your arms off and chop your legs off. He says, well, the resurrection, I'm getting them all back anyway, so I'm not worried about that. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so they were really, they're really bold in the face of torture and intimidation. But these are examples. These are heroic examples. I need to have heroes in, in, in my mind. So, Amen. But the attitude, that when God gives a command, he gets to find out what's really in our heart. And some people, some people uh, completely fail and other people rise to the occasion, show and demonstrate that they have real faith and real love for God. Now, we may be put to the test like this 90 year old Jewish man was in the story of 2 Maccabees but it's not going to be over the issue of food. All right. It's not going to be, put it, it's not going to be over the issue of, of eating pig's flesh. Anyway, there in the beginning in the church, there was a question about, do we need to follow the law of Moses? Do we need to follow all these dietary laws that we've been following for, for centuries or not? 
Paul addresses that decisively in Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Start reading in verse 8. He says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and according to Christ, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also are raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he's made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival, a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to its regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have the appearance of wisdom and self-opposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So a few things we learn here about the dietary requirements and the other things in the law of Moses. He says, the, the, the handwriting of the requirements, of requirements, was taken away and nailed to the cross. So not only were our sins nailed to the cross with Christ, but also the law of Moses was nailed to the cross as well. And he says, we are no longer to be judged by anyone regarding food or drink or Sabbath or festivals. That includes the, the dietary laws here. He says, and he says these things, not just that they were going to pass away, and they were going to nail, be nailed to the cross. He said, but these things were a shadow of things to come. All of those things in the law were foreshadowing things that have now been revealed. And he's saying, Circumcision, which he started off the discussion with, he says, circumcision foreshadows baptism. How does it foreshadow baptism? Well, it's putting away the flesh. It says that we are buried with him in baptism. It's referring to, now Paul, Paul is quoting, when he quotes the Old Testament, he's generally quoting the Septuagint. And in the story of Joshua, he's, I believe he's alluding to something here that most Christians today are not aware of. In the story of, of Joshua, there was a story about when Joshua, and the word is, his name is in Greek is the same as Jesus. So it was the Old Testament Jesus and the New Testament Jesus. So basically Jesus in the Old Testament, when he died and was buried, there's a detail in the Septuagint, and it says that the stone knives of the second circumcision were buried with him. I think what a strange thing to do. For years earlier, when the people crossed over in the promised land, they were circumcised with stone knives. And when, when Jesus was buried, they buried the stone knives of the second circumcision with him. Now, I, I mentioned in, in a previous class, whenever you see a stone that's doing something <laughs> unusual, think about Jesus. There's so many places in the Old Testament. And so this is the stone that brought about the second circumcision that is buried with Jesus. And that's what takes place in baptism. That this, we are circumcised by the rock himself, and we are buried with Jesus in baptism, as Paul explains in Romans chapter 6. If you haven't, if you haven't read the, 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 from, the, the, from the Septuagint, it's easy to, to miss that. That's in Joshua 24, 32 in, in the Septuagint. So that's what he's talking about. It says that circumcision foreshadowed 
baptism. And all these things that were in the law were foreshadowing things that have now been fulfilled. So the question to me is, all right, what is this chewing the cud and split hoops foreshadowing for us? If all these things were shadows of things that have now been fulfilled, uh, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a moment here. The significance of this story here about the dietary laws and what you can and you can't eat. Remember when the kingdom is opened up to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. And Peter is shown a vision three times as a sheet descending from heaven. And it says what was on the sheet was all kinds of animals and creeping things. This is all the stuff you're not supposed to eat. So there even been snakes and pigs and reptiles in there. And it says, kill and eat. Peter, eat it. And Peter's response is what? He says, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. Peter won't do it. Okay. <laughs> he says, this is, this is an angelic vision, a vision from the Holy Spirit. Peter says, I'm not going to, I've never done that. I'm not going to start now. So three times that happens, and God is using this figure of the clean and the unclean animals from Leviticus 11 to teach Peter a lesson that, no, what God has declared holy, let no man call unclean, let no man call common. So he's explaining that God has changed everything, and it's now being opened up to the Gentiles. In Acts 15, when they get together to say, okay, do the Gentiles have to be circumcised? They have to follow the law of Moses. And, and the conclusion is, no, they don't. They, all they have to do, they have to, do, they have to follow four things, uh, you know, no blood, no strangled animals, no sexual immorality. And um, I'm trying to think, what's the, what's the, uh, the fourth one? Uh, um, the uh, sacrifice to idols. Uh, yeah, no, no food sacrifice to idols. Thank you. So there, there are four things that they that they have to follow. They don't have to get circumcised, and they don't have to follow the dietary laws. So all those things that we that Adam agreed we can't we couldn't eat back then, we can now. That's all been been done away with. It also reminds me of what Jesus said in Mark chapter seven, which may have been foreshadowing even that. Mark chapter 7, Jesus' disciples get criticized for not washing their hands ceremonially before they eat and wash it, washing uh, the, the hands and, the, and the, the implements. And Jesus blasts the Pharisees for a few things here, actually. He uses an opportunity to teach about all kinds of things. So one of the things he says was, you can't be setting aside the commands of God for your own man-made traditions. Okay. You can't add to the word of God and bind that on other people. So he, he hits them on that, you, is that you follow the word of God. Don't try to replace it or add to it with your own man-made rules. So he, he hits them for that. But he also talks about uncleanness. What makes a person unclean? Verse 14, in Mark 7, 14. When he called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear me, everyone understand. There's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he entered the house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach is in eliminate, thus purifying all foods. And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So, the idea in Leviticus was don't be defiled. This was what he was saying. Don't be defiled. So don't eat these things. Don't take these things into your mouth. And Jesus is saying this is foreshadowing the real defilement that God is concerned. He's not considering what goes down your tongue this way. He's concerned what's coming out from the other side. He's saying that's the thing that defiles you, not, not what you're eating. It's what comes out of your heart. That's what makes you unclean. 
And it says here that he says, uh, you know, thereby declaring all foods clean. It depends on how you, uh, how you understand that statement in verse 19. The ESV uh, says, uh, uh, do you not see whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters his heart, uh, not in his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. And then it's a parenthesis that says, thus he declared all foods clean. So is Jesus perhaps declaring all foods clean in the statement? It certainly seems like it based on some of the translations. So I want to close with, with one, one final thought here. One of the things that Adam and I like to do, which, which probably most of you are not aware of, is we read animal stories together. So right now we're reading The Wind in the Willows, right? And so where, where we left off, is Mr. Toad still in jail? What, what's no, the, no, he just got out. We're on the road to visit his adventure. All right, yeah, he, he, just, he just got out. So the adventures, the adventures can say, so Adam and I, we, we love animal stories. We get animal stories together. But God uses animals throughout the scriptures to teach us lessons. Let me give you some examples. Deuteronomy 25, it says, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. And Paul says, is it oxen God is concerned about? No, God's teaching us some things through the stories of the animals. Don't give the children's bread to the dogs. Jesus said that. What's it? What are the dogs? The dogs are the, the you know the unworthy people. And in Proverbs, go to the ant, you sluggard. Uh, go tell that fox, Herod. Jesus says in Matthew 10, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. He's using four animals to describe different aspects about people. Deuteronomy 22 says, don't plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. This is foreshadowing, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Foundational principle, God uses animals to teach us things. <laughs> Peter says, like a dog returns to its vomit, or a pig when it's washed goes back to wallowing in the mud. This is about people who become Christians, and then they go back to their old unclean way of life, right? So, question, could God possibly, with all that in mind, what's all this business about eating only animals that chew the cud and have the split hoof. Why so specific about that? I'm going to give you a quote from Irenaeus. He's the bishop of the church in Lyon, writing around the year 180, in a work called Against Heresies. This is book five, chapter eight. So think about, it. he's talking about this story we just, we just read about the clean and the unclean animals. He says, now the law has figuratively predicted all these, delineating, delineating man by various animals. Whatsoever of these, says the scriptures, have a double hoof and ruminate, as choose the cud, it proclaims clean. But whatever of them does not possess one or the other of these properties, it sets themselves aside as unclean. That's just what we read about. Who then are the clean? Those who make their way by faith steadily towards the Father and the Son. For this denotes the steadiest steadiness of those which divide the hoof. And they meditate day and night upon the words of God. That is, they may adorn with good works. For this is the meaning of the ruminants. Okay, do you follow what he's saying here? He's saying those who follow the Father and the son are those with the split hoofs. And he's saying those who chew the cud, those who ruminate or those who meditate on the word of God day and night. Okay, you read the scriptures and then you're chewing on it, chewing on it, chewing on it to get all the nourishment out of it. And then he goes on, I'll throw in the notes uh, a further explanation, but he explains, he says that the Jews, they, they chew the cud. They meditate on the scriptures, but they only have the single hoof that they rely only on the father. They've rejected the son. Therefore, they are not sure footed. They're not stable. They don't have the father and the son. So they are rejected as unclean. Whereas those who have the split hooves like the pig, but they are not meditating on the word of God. Those are people who believe in the father and the son, but they're wallowing in the mud. They're eating garbage. 
They're not living holy lives that are set apart for the Lord. Okay. They're not meditating on the word of God. So it's a beautiful picture of the animal chewing the cud is somebody who is meditating on the word of God day and night. Now, now I have the, the full, the full quote in there, but that's the essence of what he's saying. So, so in this story, I believe, and after all, Paul said all of these things were foreshadowing things that are, that are for us. And, and, and Irenaeus, well, who's Irenaeus? Irenaeus, from his childhood, learned at the feet of Polycarp, who, when he was a younger man, learned directly from the Apostle John in Asia Minor. So he's one link removed from the Apostle John. So, uh, but but a number of the, of the early Christians saw in these dietary laws, there's something in here for us. This is talking about how we need to be. And just like it said, this is to help you distinguish between clean and unclean. But, it, but it's a cleanness that has to do with the mouth, but it's what comes out of the mouth, not what goes in. And it's a cleanness based on following the Father and the Son and on meditating on the Word of God day and night. Amen.